um, I'm very grateful to you for coming and to the University of Kansas and to all the sponsors of this event and especially to Doug Robinson for bringing it all to pass. Thank you very much. I want to begin with some words which I'm sure will be very familiar to you. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. <coughs> I'm sure you recognize the opening lines of Psalm 19. C.S. Lewis's favorite psalm. He regarded it as uh, the finest poem in the Psalter and one of the finest lyrics in the world. Here is C.S. Lewis on the cover of Time magazine in the 1940s, just after he published the Screwtape Letters. <coughs> That's why he's got the devil and the angel either side of his head. Uh, it says, Oxford's C.S. Lewis, his heresy, Christianity, brackets, religion. <laughs> and that came out in uh, the late 1940s, before he'd actually published the Narnia books. Um, he's always been much more popular in the States than in England, which is rather mystifying, maybe, um, unless it is really true that a, pro a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. <laughs> Um, now, in this talk, I'm going to speak for about an hour, and I want to give you, in that, t in that time, um, a brief overview about uh, C.S. Lewis's views on the heavens, and in particular, how I think he deliberately, consciously, but secretly, wove the imagery of the seven heavens into the books for which he's best known, the Seven Chronicles of Narnia. You might ask, uh, why is it worth spending an hour of your life examining these books? Aren't they just for children? Aren't, do they really deserve any serious consideration? Um, I think children's literature deserves very serious consideration. Uh, I say that for a reason given many centuries ago by Plato in the Republic who said that the beginning is the biggest part of any work, and therefore it's of supreme importance in that work, which is the construction of the human person, that children should hear good fables and not bad ones. You know the old proverb, the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And if that's true, what about the hand that holds the bedtime fairy tale? For that matter, what about the hand that writes the bedtime fairy tale? That too will have an important part to play in the eventual ruler, rulership of the world, because it's when we're very young, when, we're, when our emotional and imaginative responses to the world are still at a very formative stage, um, that anything we're told will have a, a significant effect upon us, a very sh shaping, formative effect. It will it will seriously impact the sorts of adults that we grow up to be. So I think children's literature has a good claim to being the most important kind of imaginative literature that there is. And it's interesting that um, a writer called Philip Pullman, who is, uh, who is making quite a name for himself in England as an atheistical alternative to C.S. Lewis, has... Um, has very similar views about the importance of children's literature. And he, he's trying to do for atheism what C.S. Lewis did for Christianity. Philip Pullman has said of himself and his fellow authors, we teach the world we create. He means the imaginative world that an author gets his readers to inhabit. We teach the world we create. Because a lot of what we learn about the world in stories, we will carry over into our uh, interactions with the real world. I don't know if you've seen Philip Pullman's trilogy, his dark materials, and the film The Golden Compass. Um, fortunately, The Golden Compass didn't do very well as a film, and um, <laughs> I don't think film, the other two books are going to be made into films. Talking of films, the, the Narnia books, of course, are gaining a whole new raft of readers um, through the feature film adaptations which are currently being made. 
Uh, can I just do a quick survey, actually, and ask who has seen at least one of the Narnia films or read at least one of the Narnia books? Thank you. I think that's everybody. <laughs> Is there anybody who didn't put up their hand? <laughs> you can leave now. <laughs> uh, we'll soon correct that. Anyway, C.S. Lewis creates a world um, and therefore teaches us something about the real world in his stories, I would suggest. And it's interesting that the world he creates in his stories um, is a bit puzzling. It's a bit perplexing. It has a problem of coherence about it. How does it hang together? Uh, for example, um, in the first of these seven books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, we find a great variety of different elements all thrown together seemingly at random. You have English children. You have fauns and centaurs and dryads and naiads out of Greek and Roman mythology. You have a, a snow queen, a white witch character who seems to have stepped out of the pages of a, of a Hans Andersen fairy tale. You have Father Christmas, for goodness sake. What's he doing there? Um, all sorts of different mythological strands thrown together seemingly at random. Is there any logic governing Lewis's choices of all these different things? Well, his great friend Tolkien thought that there was no governing logic. Tolkien thought that the Narnia books were a mishmash, a hodgepodge, and he um, disliked them intensely. And he soon gave up trying to read them. And many critics following in Tolkien's wake have, mary, have made very similar judgments. They've also assessed Narnia as a jumble, a hotchpotch, a mishmash, um, inconsistent, slapdash. And if they're, if they're right, <coughs> does that mean that Lewis is teaching us that the real world, too, is a jumble and inconsistent and chaotic, senseless, without any order or pattern? We teach the world we create. Well, it's interesting that most readers don't seem to have come away with that impression. Fifty years and more after these books were first published, they're still selling incredibly well, over three and a half million copies annually worldwide in over 30 different languages. It's hard to see how they could have become such classics if they were just haphazardly thrown together, if <clears throat> Lewis just dashed them off in an afternoon, um, as some of these critics seem to think. So there's an interesting mismatch here between what the critics think and what the popular reception of the books has been. However, could there be some kind of underlying imaginative structure to the book, some kind of unif unifying scheme that holds the books together, even though it doesn't immediately meet the eye? Well, Lewis himself once said that the whole series was about Christ. And a Christ-centered reading has a very great deal to recommend it. Because it's the Christ character of Aslan who's the only character who appears in all seven books. And he certainly fulfills many of the major Christ-like functions. At least he does in three books. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he is the, the savior. In The Magician's Nephew, he's the creator. And in The Last Battle, he's the judge. You then look at the other four books, and you ask yourself, how does Aslan portray Christ-like um, aspects of, of Christ's ministry and life in, in these four books? I mean, sure, he's still like Christ in many respects. He's, he goes about loving people, forgiving people, guiding people, and so on and so forth. But there's no major element of Christ's life and ministry being reenacted in these four books as there is in the first three that I mentioned. We might have expected Lewis to give us a Narnian version of, of the nativity story, say, or the ascension, or the sending of the spirit at Pentecost. Why didn't he give us Narnian versions of those things, given what he did in, those, in the first three books that I mentioned? But instead, in these four stories, he, uh, Aslan enters the story amongst dancing trees before giving a great war cry in Prince Caspian. He's seen flying in a sunbeam in the Dawn Treader. He doesn't actually appear bodily in Narnia at all in the Silver Chair. You remember he's confined to his own high country above the clouds. And in The Horse and His Boy, he's uh, mistaken for two lions or maybe three lions, and he does a great deal of dashing about in that story. He says there was only one lion, but he was swift of foot. Now, why would you make your 
Jesus' character swift of foot. I don't recall Jesus running in the New Testament. It's a mystery. So if we look to the Christ character for a sense of coherence, this problem that I talk about, the, the seeming mishmash nature of the books, only seems on the face of it to get worse. I'm going to try and show you that the, the Christian underpinnings of the book are much more thoroughgoing and sophisticated than simply just simple biblical parallels between uh, Aslan and Jesus. The Christian theology is much more sophisticated than that. So how do the books hold together? If they do. Surely they do. Lewis wasn't a man to write randomly or carelessly. His great friend Owen Barfield once said that what Lewis thought about everything was somehow secretly present in what he said about anything. He wasn't a slapdash writer or thinker. If you know his poetry, for example, his poems are fantastically complex. Mind-bogglingly so. And Lewis himself once said that the poems which look as if they're in free verse are often in the most complicated meters of all. And it's not just his own thinking and his own poetry, which is very complex. Uh, Lewis, as a historian of literature, said that intricacy is a mark of the medieval mind. And he was a medievalist himself. He loved studying the works of writers like Chaucer and Dante. Writers, he said, who like to present us with something which cannot be taken in at a glance. Everything leads to everything else, he said, but often by very intricate paths in these writers. The works at first look planless, though all is planned, he says. And as a Christian, Lewis thought that the creation was a fantastically intricate work of divine artistry. Every single thing in creation has been made both for its own sake and for the sake of every other thing down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect, he says. Now, bearing these things in mind, I don't think it's at all possible that Narnia could really just have been slopped together in an afternoon. If so, I mean, if that really is the case, then it would be entirely uncharacteristic of Lewis, and, and it would be different from what we see him to have practiced as a writer elsewhere, different from what his friends recorded about his mental habits, different from what he valued as a literary historian, different from what he believed as a Christian. And those who have studied Lewis most closely are aware of this mystery that the Narnia books present. And so they've gone looking for some kind of third level of significance that might tie the books together. The first level being the simple story, the second level being the, the obvious biblical parallels. But perhaps there's a third level of, of significance. And all sorts of theories have been suggested, like the seven sacraments, the seven deadly sins, any seven that people can think of, basically. Um, I myself once made a, a very unsatisfactory and unsuccessful attempt to link the Chronicles to different plays by Shakespeare. <laughs> um, that didn't work. <laughs> I soon abandoned that. I realized that I was just trying to force and twist the books to fit a theory of my own inventing. But it was when I wasn't looking for it that I think I stumbled across the real answer to this imaginative conundrum. And it was quite the most exciting thing that has ever happened to me while holding a book in my hands, at any rate. I was halfway through my PhD on Lewis's theological imagination at the time. And um, I then spent five years um, writing up a book about it, um, which has been mentioned. This is the book, Planet Narnia. It was brought out by Oxford University Press in 2008. Uh, you can read more about it at that website, planetnarnia.com. Um, and the BBC got interested and made a documentary about it, which was broadcast in England last year. Um, it was called, the program was called The Narnia Code. <laughs> now, as soon as you hear that title, I bet a lot of you are internally rolling your eyeballs inside your head, think, <laughs> thinking, oh yeah, here we go, some kind of Da Vinci Code nonsense. Is this going to be some fantastically complex and you know, unlikely 
conspiracy theory. Um, <clears throat> is it likely that Lewis could have invented and kept a secret like that? I mean, is it even plausible? Well, let me give you five reasons why I think it's not only possible, but probable that Lewis would have uh, done such a thing before we come on to the substance of uh, the argument itself. And the first reason has to do with C.S. Lewis himself as a person. George Sayer, who knew C.S. Lewis for 30 years and wrote a very good biography of him called Jack, The Life and Times of C.S. Lewis. Jack was C.S. Lewis's nickname. Uh, George Sayer says in that biography, Jack never ceased to be secretive. And if we're looking for examples of Lewis's secretiveness, the most obvious is the fact that when he got married in his late 50s, he kept his marriage secret for the best part of a year. <laughs> I mean, that is an extraordinary thing to do. Have you ever heard of anyone doing that? The whole point of a marriage is that it's a public relationship. A private marriage is a contradiction in terms. But Lewis kept his marriage secret for nearly a year. If you've seen the film Shadowlands, or if you know Lewis's biography, you'll know about this. He didn't tell anyone, not even a good close friend like Tolkien. A man who can do that can easily keep a literary secret. His autobiography, Surprised by Joy, left out so many things that one of his friends joked it would have been much better entitled Suppressed by Jack. <laughs> And there are many other examples of his, of his capacity for secretiveness and for, for unusual, unusually guarded privacy. But we need to, to move on. That's just the first point. Lewis, temperamentally and psychologically, was quite capable of keeping secrets, sometimes very major secrets. It wouldn't have been an impossible thing for him to do. I mean, he wasn't the sort of person who would have gone on Oprah and spilled his, his heart before millions of people. He kept his heart, he kept his serious intentions <coughs> very carefully guarded. The second point has to do with how Lewis thought about God, about Christ. He said the Narnia Chronicles were about Christ, but what did he actually believe about Christ? I mean, if you were a writer like C.S. Lewis, wanting to write a series of stories about Christ, I wonder how you'd go about doing it. If you're anything like me, you would invent a Christ character who goes about doing Christ-like things. Teaching people, loving people, forgiving people, suffering for people, and so on and so forth. And that would be a good, right, proper, biblical way of proceeding. But it would also leave out quite a lot of the bi biblical picture, wouldn't it? Because according to the New Testament, Jesus Christ is much more than just a solitary, single, individual, historical figure moving about a neutral stage, doing things to people. He's much more than that. He's the one who makes the stage. He's the Son of God. He's God the Son. He's the divine word streaming forth from the Father by whom all things were made and in whom all things hold together according to Colossians 1.17. And Lewis loved that verse. He, he is interested in it so much that he actually gave his own paraphrase of it. I think it's the only verse in the scriptures that he ever paraphrased in his own words, and he rendered it as, Christ is the all-pervasive principle of concretion or cohesion whereby the universe holds together. Christ is the glue that's, that holds everything together. He runs through everything. He must. His word has created everything and is sustaining everything. And his spirit is redeeming the universe too. Now, how do you get that cosmic aspect of Christ into your story? Relatively easy to get the, the Jesus of history into your story, but the cosmic dimension, much harder. We're already in Christ by virtue of the fact that we're his creatures. He's closer to us than we are to ourselves. If we become Christians, we then become in Christ in another way, by, by faith, by obedience, voluntarily. But we're all already in Christ because it's in Christ that all things hold together. And that, that puts us into something of a predicament. We can't, in that sense, step outside Christ and look back at him. 
as if from some external spectator's point of view. We have no Christless universe in which to do that. We can't get outside him. It puts us into a, some, into a predicament which Lewis wrote about in his book Miracles, where he said, the fact which is in one respect the most obvious and primary fact, and through which alone you have access to all the other facts, may be precisely the one that's most easily forgotten. Forgotten not because it's so remote or abstruse, but because it's so near and so obvious. And that's exactly how the supernatural has been forgotten. Christ is closer to us than we are to ourselves. He's in everything. Everything is in him, held together by him, created for him and through him. People who live next door to railway stations don't hear the trains because the trains are always going on. In the same way, we can overlook the divine nature, not because it's far away, but because it's so close. Chesterton once said that if you want to hide something, put it in the open, where people walk past it every day of their lives and never give it a second glance. So that's the, first, that's the, that's the theological point. The first point was Lewis's personality. The second point, uh, Lewis's interest in the overlookability of the divine nature. The third point has to do with his understanding of consciousness. He once said that an influence which cannot evade our consciousness will not go very deep. What does he mean by consciousness? Two things, <clears throat> which he wrote about in an essay called Meditation in a Tool Shed. He pictures himself standing in the darkness of his tool shed one sunny day. It's, it's dark inside this shed, but it's bright outside, and through a crack at the top of the door, he can see a beam of light slanting down through the darkness of the shed. He can see little particles of dust floating in the sunbeam, and it lights up a small patch of the floor. And this he uses as an image of one kind of consciousness, looking at the beam, contemplation. If you know French, it's, it's like savoir knowledge, knowledge about something from the outside. He then shifts his position so that the beam of light is no longer falling on the floor, it's now falling on his eyes. And instantly, he said, the whole picture changed. He no longer saw the beam. The beam, in fact, vanished because he saw along the beam. And what he saw along it was the crack at the top of the door, the leaves on the tree waving in the wind outside, millions of miles away, the sun itself. And this he uses as an image of a second kind of consciousness that he calls enjoyment. If you know French, it's, kind of, it's like connaître knowledge, knowledge by acquaintance, the sort of knowledge you have of someone, not when you're just you know, reading facts about them, um, on, a, on their Facebook page, but when you are actually in a relationship with them, you know, a real relationship, not a virtual relationship. You don't know about them, you know them. And Lewis said that we should really divide consciousness into three. We tend to think that consciousness only has two kinds, the subconscious and the conscious. Lewis says, no, we need three divisions, the subconscious, the contemplated, and the enjoyed. He says we should be like the ancient Persians who debated everything twice, once when they were sober and once when they were drunk. <laughs> <laughs> there are benefits to our knowledge of being drunk, that is to say, of being inside an experience, immersed in it. Light is not something you see, it's something you see by. There's a kind of knowledge which, which, is the, which, which is known by virtue of the fact that you are inside it. That kind of personal knowledge is much more valuable than external, detached, dispassionate knowledge. But the interesting thing is that when you're inside it, you don't see it in the same way. The beam of light becomes invisible. It becomes not so much an object that you look at, it's the, it's the whole field of vision within which you see. So when Lewis says that an influence which cannot evade our consciousness will not go very deep, what he means is an influence which cannot evade our contemplative savoir consciousness will not go very deep. It needs to sink down into our enjoyment consciousness, 
into personal committed consciousness before, before it really touches the depths of our being. For as long as you're holding something at arm's length, studying it from outside, you won't really know it. So that was the third point, his understanding about consciousness. There's an aspect of consciousness which by its very nature is hidden from us because we're inside it. Thirdly, uh, fourthly, a, a literary <laughs> interest in hiddenness. He once wrote a paper called The Kappa Element in Romance. Kappa means, uh, is, the, is the initial letter of the Greek word krypton, which means uh, cryptic or hidden. Um, and romance just means a, a fairy tale, a, a story, an adventure story. It doesn't mean a love affair in this context. So the kappa element in romance basically just means the hidden element in story. And again, what Lewis is talking about here is the, is the atmosphere or flavor of a story. The example he, he uses to kick off this essay is drawn from the last of the Mohicans. He says that in that book, when the hero of the story is half sleeping by his bivouac fire in the woods, while a redskin with a tomahawk is silently creeping up on him from behind, what makes for the essence of that scene isn't simply the fact that the hero is in danger, but that he's in danger from <clears throat> a redskin with a tomahawk. You, you could have turned the tomahawk into a pistol or a revolver, and that would have put your hero into much greater danger, but a pistol doesn't belong in that world. It's a world of snow and snowshoes, of canoes and wigwams and feathered headdresses and war paint and Hiawatha names and high cheekbones and whiskered trousers and, and yes, tomahawks, not pistols. Lewis says this, to be stories at all, stories must be series of events, but it must be understood that this series, the plot as we call it, is only really a net whereby to catch something else. The real theme may be, and perhaps usually is, something that has no sequence in it, something other than a process and much more like a state or a quality. So the last of the Mohicans gives you access to the, the state or the quality of red skinnery, Lewis says in his very outdated language. Um, the Three Musketeers, on the other hand, is a bad book, he says, because it has no weather to it. It's, it's got no, it gives us no beams to look along, it's just a lot of little beams to look at. The characters go from London to Paris, and there's no sense that Paris is any different from London. It's a bad book. And incidentally, this, uh, this idea about, about the hidden element in story um, goes back uh, to Lewis's teenage years, uh, when he was only 18. We find him writing to a friend about a story he'd just written, and he says to this friend, I fear you will like the main gist of my story even less when you grasp it. <laughs> if you ever do. Uh, for, he goes on, as is proper in romance, the inner meaning is carefully hidden. That's Lewis at age 18. We shouldn't be surprised that he's interested in hiddenness in literature. Now, fifthly and finally, one last aspect of his interest in hiddenness. Uh, as a literary historian, Lewis noted that there were, there were various approaches that medieval and Renaissance writers used when they were attempting to, um, to depict God. One particular technique that they used it was called transferred classicism. In transferred classicism, God is disguised in some degree as a mere god. Chaucer, Dante, Spencer, writers as late as Milton in the uh, 17th century used this technique in which, as Lewis said, the gods are god incognito and everyone is in the secret. Paganism, he says, is the religion of poetry through which the author can express just so much or so little of his real religion as his art requires. And just as those medieval and Renaissance writers took the classical gods and used them as a series of masks under which they could say something about the true God of Christianity, so Lewis, I think, has done a very similar thing uh, in the seven Narnia books. 
So we've now finished our detour and we're back where we started. Um, <coughs> how do the Narnia books hold together? If they do, um, we are making progress, I, I assure you. Um, and here at this point, um, it's worth emphasizing something else about C.S. Lewis, which is that he was an academic. We know him best for the Narnia books, and then probably for books like Mere Christianity and the Screwtape Letters. We tend to overlook the fact that he wrote those books in his off hours. They were sidelines to him. He wasn't a professional writer of fiction, and he wasn't a professional Christian apologist. He was professionally an academic. He taught for nearly 30 years at Oxford and for nearly 10 years at Cambridge. I wonder how many people have read this book. English literature in the 16th century excluding drama. Snappy title. <laughs> Uh, it was part of this multi-volume series of books called The Oxford History of English Literature, or Oh Hell, as Lewis called it. <laughs> he rather regretted taking on this book. It took him f 15 years to write. It was the biggest book he ever wrote. But has anybody here read it? Yeah, or two, two, one person. It's a, it's a fascinating book, actually. It's really worth reading. It's very readable. And if you read it, you find that the first 20 pages or so are all about uh, this chap, Nicholas Copernicus, who, in the middle of the 16th century, wrote a book called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Bodies. It was an epoch-making work. He ushered in modern cosmology. Until Copernicus, it was believed that the Earth was the center of everything, the static central Earth, the geocentric cosmos. And after Copernicus, we realized that the Sun was, the cent was central. We go around the Sun. The Sun doesn't go around us. So in a sense, Copernicus <laughs> relocated Earth. We had thought we were at the center. He showed us that we were actually at the periphery. It has a claim to being the biggest change that there's ever been in human thought. Copernicus is kind of a big deal. <laughs> and because this Copernican revolution happened slap bang in the middle of the 16th century, which was Lewis's focus of study, he naturally paid a good deal of attention to it and tried to work out what, what effects it had had on people's imaginations and their understanding of their place in the universe. Uh, he wrote another book called The Discarded Image, which again starts, uh, which, uh, which has a, a long section all about Copernicus and the change brought about by his theory, which was later proved to be correct by Galileo. And three times in The Discarded Image, Lewis uh, suggests to the reader that they should take a walk under the sky at night and look up at the sky, imagining themselves uh, to be pre-Copernican people. These days, you look up at the night sky and you think you're looking up into empty space. Black, cold, vacant space. But back in medieval times, you would have looked up not into space, but the heavens. It was believed that the night sky was arranged in a series of concentric spheres, or circles, or heavens, each of which contained its own planet. The first of which was the, was the moon. The moon was regarded as a planet in those days, not just a, a satellite of Earth. Above the moon's sphere was Mercury's, then in the third heaven, Venus, then the sun. The sun, remember, was a planet in these days. This is, of course, long before astronomers had discovered Uranus or Neptune, let alone the ill-fated Pluto, <laughs> which had a brief, glorious career as a planet for about 70 years, and then, as you remember, just a few years ago, was relegated to the status of a dwarf planet. <laughs> Poor old Pluto. <laughs> it must have been a bit of a come down. Um, above, above the sun came Mars, then Jupiter, and in the seventh heaven, Saturn. Still today, you occasionally hear people say, I was in the seventh heaven of delight. And it was delightful to be in the seventh heaven, 
because up there you were nearest the home of God. You were getting towards the very edge of the created universe, outside of which was God's own home. It was believed. And it was also thought that these planets exerted influences over the Earth, shedding a set of characteristics upon people and events and even the metals uh, in Earth's crust. <clears throat> 